Thank you very much. Welcome to the November 28th Select Board meeting, which is called to order at 6.16 p.m. Uh, we have a couple more wrap-up things to do from the other night, and I'm hoping to get uh, the, the other Select Board members here before we take a position on Article 19. <coughs> so before we do that, we will do a couple of the other things that we still have pending. Um, one of them is the parking and street closure re request for Mary Maple. There had been a, uh, a problem with the one that we had approved several weeks ago, so we just need to approve the correction that takes into account some public safety issues that have to do with the horse rides. So we will do that quickly. Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? I move that the select board amend the select board's vote of November 5th, 2012 to one, prohibit parking in the entire Spring Street lot from 2 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. and two, rescind blocking off that part of the North Pleasant Street as it is not yet necessary for the horse carriage, horse drawn carriage rides. Second. <laughs> Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay, let's do, uh, still waiting for Mr. Wild, let's do the taxi license. I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Edward LaDuce on behalf of Celebrity Cab for the calendar year 2012. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Hardly pays. Aye. It's very little time left That's in 2012, right. but okay. There we go. Um, we might as well do the Chapter 61 right of first refusal. This is a parcel of land on Flat Hills Road that is being taken out of Chapter 61. Uh, it could become a building lot, and we've dealt with these like, several times over the past several years, and in fact, past several weeks, we had another one. Um, we have recommendations from both the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board to not exercise the <coughs> town's right of first refusal on this property. It is, uh, as per usual, not something that has been identified on the open space uh, plan, and it doesn't have any particular water issues, et cetera. So there's no specific interest in why the town would buy this parcel. Um, so those are our recommendations. Does anybody have any questions about that, Mr. Heaton? No, just a, a recollection that the other two lots that are almost next door have received similar recommendations from, well, all three of these boards when we get to our vote. Yes. Correct. Any other questions? I just have a comment. It seems sort of contrary to the spirit of master plan to convert these lots into basically it's going to turn out to be a development so I'm not totally happy about this particular use but I don't think there's anything the town can do about it. Correct and uh, there's a member of the planning board who consistently expresses that viewpoint also that it is uh, in, in an area that's undeveloped and hence not in keeping with the master plan for encouraging development in built up areas. At the same time, the way to prevent that would be for the town to buy the property, and so buying the property is not uh, yeah, in the feasible. cards. <laughs> right. So. Okay. All right. So I make a motion. Yes, please. I move that the select board, in accordance with MGL Chapter 61, Section 8, mm -hmm. to not exercise the town's right of first refu refusal to purchase Lot 1 as described on a Plan of Land entitled Plan of Land located in Amherst MA, Perens, Flat Hills Road, and Perens, prepared for WD Coles Incorporated, dated January 28, 2012. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And I believe that was unanimous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. All right, then Article 19. So when we left off the other night, we were talking about Article 19, which is some amendments to the nuisance house bylaw. Um, the petitioners have brought forth uh, a couple of changes to this, one of which puts property managers in the line of communication for, um, for uh, violations that occur uh, at their property. Um, another one was changing who was going to notify uh, from the police department to the town manager's office, but in negotiations between the petitioners and the police chief and town manager, they all agreed that it's better to keep it with the police department, so that's not going to be a change. Um, and changing some of the wording where it says may to shall. Um, so when we left off Monday night, um, Mr. Musanti was suggesting that it gives the town greater discretion if there were to be an additional sentence added that, that referenced that discretion. Um, we decided rather than be hasty about 
a decision on this the other night because we were already late, we would take this up now. So uh, I think that's pretty much where we left off. So would folks like to comment at all on that? Ms. Fine. May I ask <coughs> Chief Ripping Stone a question? <laughs> okay, good. We just happens um, to be here. Wouldn't it be easier for the police department after you've given two $300 fines and you're at the third one mm -hmm. um, to just be able to say no? Um, in other words, you should be able to say if you wish that or you should be able to say that response costs shall be assessed um, and there's no um, wiggle room this this amendment or this suggested amendment from the town manager leaves it in your hands to decide with the decision process <clears throat> one of the areas of concern that i really wasn't a, a one-size-fits-all kind of situation because we have a number of landlords and property owners that are working very closely with the town and the police department um, to make changes, you know, whether it be having security personnel, security lighting, making changes, um, landscaping to, you know, make it less attractive for students to hang out and go to parties. So I felt there were a number of property owners um, who that might be So I would say that there, I, I don't think that going from may to shall necessarily takes away that discretion. I think that just like, you know, if you're going uh, uh, 80 miles an hour you, and you get stopped, you, you, you know, general law probably says you will get a ticket, but you won't necessarily get a ticket. Maybe you'll get a warning or whatever. So, uh, mm. and I shouldn't speak to laws that I don't actually know what their wording is, but is there, <laughs> it sounds is, good. <laughs> is there a, is there, is that a valid analogy? Do you know what a speeding law says? Well, I mean, there's always police, well, not always. There are two laws in the book that really mandate that police do something, and those are the domestic violence laws. Uh, those are the only two laws that we can find that actually mandate that uh, police officers do arrest somebody. So it's very rarely done, but that doesn't mean that in this case um, it would be workable or doable. You know, after further discussion with the town manager and, and some of the petitioners, you know, I'm not, I'm, this isn't going to be something that really holds things up, in my opinion, or, or breaks the deal. Okay. Ms. Brewer. And I, it doesn't sound as though <coughs> it's something that is going to cause problems interfacing with our rental registration as we come up with it in the future, you know, that it's not of a particularly different tone than that. And again, I mean, this is at a third offense. And, and I didn't really like the analogy somebody made to three strikes policy because it's very different than a three strikes policy. It's just paying some money. It's not that you're losing your house. It's not like you're getting executed on the common. Okay? It's, just, <laughs> it's just saying, come on now. It's been the third time because we actually don't have very many repeat offenders after the 300 That's as right. it stands right now. And so we're saying you would be such an outlier that we definitely want to get money from you because you're just not getting it at that point. So I feel comfortable with leaving it the way it is, not feeling like I'm tying the police up in knots and saying they won't have any discretion at all. Yeah, but, and I agree with that. I mean, it's certainly, you know, I think we all know there, which properties are the problem properties and which landlords are the problem landlords. And that probably will be the ones who end up getting addressed in the long run if, if it comes to that. So. You know, probably some false concerns in mind, but certainly they were concerns. So I want to be clear that when we talk about <coughs> changing and making these changes, the 
assessing the costs to uh, the property managers, including them in the line of, of onus here, happens on the third offense, a, a point we haven't gotten to yet, um, which speaks to other reference issues yeah. with the law. Um, but it also changes the sh maze to shall for the first two offenses on the students. So I, I personally am, um, I'm really torn on this because on the one hand, I think it's really important that the town has and uses as many tools as it has at its discretion. And as a municipality, we only have so many potential tools at our discretion. Um, at the same time, going back to that word discretion, um, I think that the discretion is a really important part of this. So. I would be happier with it being uh, may on the first two and shall on the third. Because really, if you get to three, come on now. Like, learn your lesson. But, uh, but, uh, but expend, uh, assessing costs, response costs on the first two on the students seems to me um, that, that's a little bit further afield. Um, Mr. Fox, did you want to come? You're, you're fine where you are. Yeah. 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 Uh, just on the, the question of shall. What we do have is that the, 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 on the first response cost, they shall be assessed against the neighbors in the town. They have to pick it up in their property taxes. Somebody has to pay for it. So it is an expense of the town, expense of the neighbors. Second, public nuisance. It says shall, in effect, to the neighbors and to the rest of the town. You will pick up the cost. So it seems very fair that on the third time, I'm talking about the owner, landlord, and the resident manager, that even if they have good excuses, it's their property, it's their profit, they build it into their cost. At that point, you shall, the resident, the resident manager, the owners, you pick up the cost. That seems a very fair distribution of responsibility. Um, so I guess I, I hear you and I, and I more or less agree. At the same time, um, I think that uh, <clears throat> That, that that's exactly where the discretion element comes in. You know, some kids, the fact that we've never gotten to three speaks to the fact that, that one uh, warning is typically very effective. Um, two sometimes is needed. We haven't gotten to three yet on the same property within the same calendar year with the same kids. So again, we've got some issues there. But th there, there's a lot of evidence that it is effective per property per student. Um, I, I, I think that if we get too far down the line of thinking, um, well, we're all bearing the costs for that, you know, then you could say, you know, when the, when the police or in the fire respond to the guy who falls off his roof or something, then you could all say, well, geez, the town is paying for the fact that you were up on your roof. That was pretty dumb, you know, or whatever. So I, I, think, that, I think that you have to be careful about the idea of assessing response costs. It's the third time he falls off the roof, maybe. Well, that's my point. That's my point. So, so on third, I'm fine with that. But the other two, I think that I think that we want to imply the broader discretion. And, and for the record, I think there's discretion on all of them. I just think that the implication is stronger um, if you say may on the first two and shall on the third. It's really saying that it, you know it, it, it strengthens the fact that three is serious and. I, don't know. I could go along with saying shall for the second and third on the grounds there should be no repeaters and in fact there almost never are. So that would be fine. Anybody who, I mean we have had problems with students throwing cams and other weapons at the police and I think the more stringent but stricter this reads, the more likely it would be to have the positive effect that they were after. I mean, we kept hearing during town meeting, it's behavior we want to modify. <laughs> so I, I would be happy to have shall all the way through, but I could live with shall after the first offense on the grounds if they haven't learned it, then they should have. So uh, that would take an amendment from the floor, I guess, but. Right, so, and, and in some ways we might be splitting hairs and making this too complicated. So um, it, there is a sense that there is still discretion with shall. That's right. right? I mean, so there's an expectation that um, 
that, that there's going to be discretion, but it does send a strong message to the students, to the residents, if it says shall, and then the discretion happens from there. And you know, you can wordsmith this stuff to death. Um, we, in dealing with the university on getting them to unambiguously apply the code of student conduct off campus, it was the same kind of issue. They were saying things like, oh, well, it already applies. We're like, no, it barely applies. Your wording is such that it is just these big, giant loopholes. Um, so I don't believe we took away any discretion from the university in whether or not it applies, but we strengthened the language to, to give them more area to enforce it. Um, so oh, it on, so sounds like you could live with this. So I could, yeah. All right. But so how about I if I make a motion? Are, how anybody else have comments, Mr. Wall? It's a little like you a little bit hesitant because <clears throat> most people misuse shall and would and will and should in common English. In legal English, shall is a very strong word, usually imposing an obligation. And I would be nervous about putting shall in the first case also. I guess what I'm asking is I think, you know, if I don't want to give the police discretion in legal matters, I don't know who might give it to in enforcement matters. I trust the police to use good judgment. But are we playing a, a game here? If we say the legal language obligates the police to do things, but they don't really have to, and we don't care. And then what if some citizen says, but you busted this guy three times, and it says, shall impose costs, and the chief says, I don't think we're going to do that for very good reasons. Could someone then attack the town as not upholding the law? Yeah, I've asked that very question to uh, town council uh -huh. about the use of the word shall, and town council <coughs> has advised that um, um, even with the word shall, uh -huh. The police do retain some discretion, okay. and but it certainly sends a clear message. Yeah, we just want to put the police um, in a bad situation where they caught in the middle of all this. Uh, sentiment of town meeting, etc. Mm -hmm. I've made clear to the petitioners, you know, multiple times that I think overall the article, as you know, now drafted, strengthens the overall nuisance house bylaw. So, n with the knowledge that. Uh, well, it's not as explicit in the language as you might want to make, right. which is where I was trying to go last time. Yeah. Um, there still is some discretion retained, but it certainly sends a very clear signal. Okay, as long as the police are protected. Okay. And it particularly sends a clear signal to the folks whose behavior right. we want to be deterring. Right. <laughs> so, right. um, okay, so basically I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm fine with the shell. Mr. Hayden. Well, I want, to, uh, <clears throat> I want to debate with you on being fine with it. Um, the... Um, shall for the third offense, that's clear. I think, I think we can all agree on that. It's an interesting, I want to introduce a, a concept that I think is a little bit um, uh, not as legalistic as, you know, we're trying to make this. And that is that um, Amherst, because it is host to um, 26,000 teenagers, well, recent teenagers, we have I don't want to say an obligation, but we certainly have the task of being part of helping them into adulthood. And um, the idea of saying, hey, you screw up once and that's it, um, I think is not a reasonable one. For anyone who's raised a teenager, I think you may recall that you know the first time out doesn't always work. Um, and the first time is not necessarily... Excuse me. Excuse me. You, um, you have to be quiet because of the ambient mics. Thank you. Yeah, it's not necessarily criminal. And um, we've made it criminal by putting a shall there. Even with all of the, the wiggle room that our lawyers are going to give us, I think it's, it's a signal that, hey, we think the first time you do that, it's criminal. Now, to the neighbors next door, it probably feels that way. But, you know, as being part of a community, you know, okay, here's, here's the fine. Don't do that again. Do it again, and you shall. Well, basically, it's just a way of increasing the fine. And so no. state law limits us to $300 for a, a finable offense. Um, so this is actually a way around being able to make that fine a bit bigger. And in some ways, I don't have a problem with that either. <laughs> um, the, the fines have proven to be very effective. And the higher the fine, the more effective it is. And I, I was just part of a, a big um, uh, thing today about party registration in Fort Collins, Colorado, and how they deal with it. They went from a fine of $100 to register a party to, or rather for a violation, a party violation, to $1,000. Like $1,000. And, and yet still that wasn't quite effective enough. But there's a, there's a lot to be said for high fines. So, so that part's not particularly compelling. Mr. Hayden. Um, part of our role, I imagine, 
is, is um, maybe soulful, not only pugilistic. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, again, speak strongly for keeping the May for the first one. Just to be clear that, um, you know, we are accepting these folks in town. We're going to accept that they can screw up, and yes, that will cost them. And if they do it a second time or a third time, it'll cost them more. Uh, and I know they're not going to like it, but yeah, sorry. I'd like to just say, um, um, there are a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think the police chief has and will continue to use his discretion. He frequently gives students a, a verbal warning, and sometimes that's absolutely the most appropriate thing to do and perfectly adequate. I believe he only gives a, a citation, if you like, of some sort, when there's with additional um, violations that are clearly illegal, <coughs> alcohol uh, issues, violence. Um, disobeying the police, something of that sort. He's not out there, you know, handing out three dollar fine, three hundred dollar fines at every possible noise instance. He's already using his discretion, and I'm sure he will continue to do so. And I don't think you need to worry about that. And secondly, it's going to be very difficult to separate the first and second responses in the bylaw because their first and second responses are being treated the same way. So we would have to work, rewrite that or an amendment would have to rewrite that bit. And I think. Um, as I say, I think the police give verbal warnings even before this even comes into a, um, into, a, into play. And also, they get a tremendous amount of education and knowledge that these, these things are not approved of. And that they need to, you know, <coughs> ask their neighbors if they want to have a party or alert them or something, and, and just like the rest of us do. So I, I don't think this is an issue, really. I think this is normal citizen behavior, I expect, in common. And I think the police chief and his people are are very good about handing out warnings and, and telling them to shape up. So I, I think kind of the bottom line here is we're all agreeing that there is discretion and that the that shall sends a certain stronger message than may, but does not reduce the discretion at all. Um, so because I don't think we can both say that that shall Obligates on one offense, but is, but not doesn't on yet another. Like so, I think I think we're we're agreeing that that shall is an obligation. Sh shall maintains discretion. You think it means discretion? There's still discretion. Yeah, there's still. Shall means discretion. Shall it shall does not deny discretion. That even if it says shall, the police are just as you said. They still have the potential to do a warning or whatever they have to do. But what we're doing is sending a stronger signal with our intention that these kinds of responses, we don't want that response, we certainly don't want it repeated, and we have the ability to find you in multiple ways for in these issues, in these instances, rather, Ms. Brewer and then Ms. Brewer. And, and the fact that, you know, as, as we've talked about, and then the town managers talked about with the town attorney, we, there is no personage who's going to say, oh, police, you are bad because you didn't, I mean, there could be neighbors who say that, there could be individual people who say, why didn't you do, there could be bloggers who say that. But there is no means of saying that's illegal, we're going to sue you for not doing that, blah, 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 blah. So it doesn't have that kind of ramification, so I don't feel like it's putting people in an untenable position. The other thing that, although it sounds like maybe in an ideal world, it would have been written and cannot really at this last minute be written as may, shall, shall. Um, <laughs> which may have solved all this, um, is that one of the things that's actually, I think, good about the response costs and leaving it at $300 versus some of the much huger fines, which, again, I'm taking that somewhat out of context, but we know there are larger fines for other things other places, is to realistically portray what it is. It isn't just we're sending you a big bill. It isn't just let's pick a number out of the air that sounds bad. It's this is what it costs us. To deal with this and so that's one of the things I actually really like about this is developing the response cost so that it's not it doesn't go you know 50 300 750 or something but it's actually related to real life yeah. and I think that that's a much better you know instance of why we're doing this as opposed to we're just trying to make you know, we're just trying to rip the students off right and and why wouldn't we want to to where appropriate assess right. those costs. Like, why wouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's good for everybody um, when that's considered the appropriate thing to do. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, because the first time you fall off the roof, it's because you were stupid. <laughs> um, but that's not my question. I, I'm, I'm wondering what sort of discretion we're talking about that shall gives. I mean, if you assess the $300 fine, then we shall 
bring administrative costs in. <coughs> That's it's, I don't quite understand the wiggle room that that leaves. And I'm wondering if, if that can be in the in the remaining 30 seconds before we have to adjourn to town meeting. I could help you help to understand that. I can't, I, I think I can't recite the, the legal well, I, yeah. uh, terminology that was used. It was just a very clear opinion expressed by council that despite what you might take away intuitively from the right. use of the word shall, that there is discretion that is retained. Yeah. Um, I really I can't. Yeah, because if my, my concern would be that if that discretion is deciding not to, uh, to offer the $300 ticket and do a verbal warning, when I think we would want it to be the other way around, that, then, then that's kind of defeating well, you know, in the, the, the proposed language, it's, it's talking about but, assignment of the response, potential assignment of the response costs, not the three hundred dollar. Oh, okay. Fine, that's that's clear a, because a, that would be a different kettle of fish. Whether yeah. this happens in addition to that third three hundred dollar fine. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Stein, did you have another comment? No. <clears throat> I thought the discretion. Well, I was just going to say the discretion comes with the assignment of any fine. And the costs on top of it, I think, are a very good idea for just the reasons Alyssa said. It has to be clear that what they're doing, their behavior, has cost the town and we are seeking reimbursement. I think that's almost better than the fine, but it goes along with the fine, and that's just fine with me. <laughs> fine, Sorry. Fine, fine. All right, so I'd like to make a motion and we'll see what I would good. love to. I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 19, petition, general bylaw, nuisance house, including the following draft amendment for consideration. Oh, we get to, uh, where is it? No. We just so do the one. Yeah, we're just doing okay. the top one. Yeah, stop after nuisance house. So as it stands, in other words, or I'll read it again. I move that the select board recommend November 19, 2012, special town meeting, Article 19, petition, general bylaw, nuisance house. Second. Do we want to stay as amended? Because if you're going oh. to be making an amended motion on this with the changing okay, the- Okay, um, so let's- Yeah. yeah. Yes, right. let's right. say as amended by the petition. As amended by the petition. Yes. Second. Okay, Mr. Hayden. But I want to be very clear that we're not going to be charging people, um, for instance, maybe the BID for doing the Merry Maples, inviting the police to come and control traffic. We're not going to be charging administrative costs for people to put their car in the ditch and might need a policeman to direct their traffic around. We're not going to charge beyond the ambulance fees for when you come tumbling off of your roof. Um, that we're only going after students. Public nuisances. So, well, so I, I think that I, I think that what I so what mm -hmm. Mr. Hayden is saying I think is um, trying to illustrate the point here. And um, so the point is that um, we need to, as this as the costs get considered, what is a response cost? There's kind of what's above and beyond what one is entitled to as a citizen in a town where there is public safety. There's kind of an above and beyond cost, mm -hmm. maybe. And, uh, and so the things that you're talking about certainly fall within the areas of, of things we're already essentially entitled to as citizens of a community where we support public safety. So maybe, maybe that factors into the to, to what this cost schedule looks like. There's a certain amount of cost that you're, of response costs that you're simply entitled to through property taxes, et cetera. But then there's this extra that's because you've done something that is really pretty bad out there and, and that's, the, that's the response cost you're getting assessed at. So does, how does that feel to you as a concept? Uh, I, I, I think it's it, the point. I mean, it, it's, I, mean I don't know when, when stupidity slides into nuisance and that's 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 the question that, that, that I want to keep before us even as we take our vote now okay further discussion all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. and that was unanimous thank you thank you for helping us tease through this all right Mr. O'Connor I see you're here but we did not expect you so we've got like just a couple minutes to deal with okay, this so have, I, I provided a copy of uh, the motion I, I, yeah. I did it on behalf of the uh, 
the neighborhood organization may ask you to speak to this. And, and to, uh, after we had gone to public hearings to revise the proposal so that it would meet the um, objections of the planning board and the concerns for the, for the need for exceptions that were articulated at the public hearing. And I've done so, uh, again, you, if you have the, the, the I, I made some notes underneath. This is not, this is not something terribly complicated. The only thing is we, we have passed a, a, an addition to the bylaw that is numbered um, uh, 3.14. So the motion will be 3.15 because 3.14 is already taken. By, by previous action of the town need. Um, and, you know, there's, there are two issues, really. Uh, one is to get ahead of the curve in terms of McMansions so that people can't demolish houses to provide, for, and to provide an exception for people who buy, you know, small rundown houses and, and one who, uh, um, demolish the house and build something that's appropriate in the neighborhood and so forth. And, and there's the, the second paragraph provides um, an exception um, uh, in accordance with the, the existing processes that because all demolitions go to the historical commission and then it, it says that the planning board can grant a special permit um, if it's as long as the um, to add more residential square footage, but not additional um, units, uh, if the as long as the replacement structure is consistent with the scale and architecture of the existing <coughs> streetscape, so it protects neighborhoods from having you know a ten thousand somebody buy a, they're going to have a ten thousand square foot house you know on your block, which is you know which is the McMansion problem, um, and uh, and then. Uh, uh, and then there's an exception to that that, that the, uh, such a permit wouldn't be available until the process um, that a local historic district is going through uh, would be completed. And uh, uh, so that's it's my feeling pretty straightforward, designed to meet, um, uh, you know situations, one that is happening in other places but hasn't quite reached Amherst, the McMansion issue, and to the, the demolition thing we've seen. Um, we've seen outbuildings proposed and, and to be and demolished, and we, we have some very aggressive um, um, purchasers of single family homes who, who are asking for permits that as a result of our action in town meeting already, are going to have to get not just site plan review but special permits, and we don't want the the special permit application to be a simultaneous filing for a demolition permit. That if you don't give me the special permit, I'm going to demolish the house and, and build something else. So we want to control that possibility by uh, restricting the number that you can't increase the number of units and. With one, you know, with the exception that's in paragraph two, that you can increase the the amount of residential square footage. Okay, so let me ask for questions or comments from select board for Mr. O'Connor, Mr. Heaton. Um, I'm going to, when it comes time, suggest that we um, we recommend referring this back to the um, the planning board. Um, I understand the intent, and for seven years, um, I was on the planning board trying to figure out how to regulate against big mansions and couldn't really find a way to do that. And maybe this is the way, maybe this is the key. Um, but um, I, I'm finding, as it's presented, two things. One is that it probably is okay to make this amendment because it reduces the scope from the, the original thing that's in the, in the warrant now. And if I was the moderator, I think I would, would find that. But second, um, it has um, often been noted in, um, when we're dealing with even the smallest zoning amendments that there are um, tentacles, there are effects intended and sometimes in, uh, unintended um, that 
do need to be thought through. Um, but the public hearing process, for instance, helps us with that. Um, also, um, th there's a lot, there are a lot more resources that would be available through that process to um, squaring this with the rest of the zoning bylaw, which is, this is not quite, this has got some, some little things that don't look right to me, don't look like they fit perfectly. Like, um, there's some things that don't exist yet, and it also doesn't protect a lot of, you know, things that I think it intends to protect. Thank you. Ms. Stein. We did get extensive comments from the staff, and the revisions were made in light of those comments. I understand. To, to take them into account, and, I, and we have not gotten, since the planning board got this a week ago, Monday, we have not gotten any further expressions of concern from the, from the planning staff. Okay. I'm going to let Ms. Stein comment or question. Um, I do have a question. I wonder why other than by an act of God is left in there because that would mean a lightning strike takes something down and then you could build a 10-story house if you wanted to. No? Right. And the reason to, to do that is that um, I think that those um, – I actually – I actually know of a situation where a lightning strike did take down somebody's house. I actually did some very small amount of work on that house. And um, my recollection was that the residential square footage was increased. It would have been, I think, an onerous process to have the person get a special permit um, after suffering, one, the destruction of their house by, by both fire and then water. Um, and then also uh, the, the in, incredible process of dealing with the insurance companies. And it, it's a process that I wish on nobody, absolutely nobody. And so I, that was in there to simply unburden somebody who was that, un, you know, had that un, lack of okay. fortune uh, from, from, a, from having to get a permit from the town. Um, I'm wondering, I, I share Mr. Hayden's concerns about this being considered kind of in a vacuum and without the whole process connected to it. Um, we've been making a lot of effort at increasing residential density in various areas in downtowns and in certain ring areas uh, in the, the village center districts, um, not the ones that we haven't created yet, but the ones that we have. Um, I, so I'm not sure that this would be uh, consistent with that, and I don't want to take a step backward from that situation. We know perfectly well that the question of uh, uh, student housing, for example, comes up all the time. I wouldn't want to do something that has unintended consequences of, say, tying our hands to create a, an ideal student housing place sometime down the road that involved having to knock something down and then put up something very dense. Or I wouldn't want to have to uh, deal with the fact that uh, there are very there are places in town and just outside of downtown that even the gateway process uh, revealed are ripe for redevelopment. I wouldn't want this to unintentionally tie our hands in those ways. I don't think we can answer those questions satisfactorily right now. I think it needs to go through a whole process of um, considering how how this fits into the uh, to the other plans and zoning bylaw um, concepts that we have approved lately, and so um, I would support Mr. Hayden's idea of referral so it could be considered more fully. The only thing is that this actually was submitted. The the, the article was submitted in in mid September, um, which was you know a month before some of the planning board articles were finalized, and, and this. And, and language very close to this was submitted uh, the last week in October in response to the public hearing on October 17th. So we, we did, you know, it's been around and there has been very extensive communication, email communication between the group, um, primarily uh, uh, Professor Adams and, uh, and Mr. Tucker. So I'm, I'm just here because uh, I was asked um, on behalf of the group to, to advocate for this article. I, do, I don't think it would have impact one, the gateway project. Of course, that land belongs to the university, and we, we don't control what they do on their property. Right, so the gateway process, though, identified different parts of downtown for and Also, I, I'm, 
I'm very much of the mind that rather than leaving the door open to demolition, I, I really believe in the conversion process. And I, whether you want to convert a large single family home to four units or however many are allowed in the district, I'm fine with that as long as it's well managed and, and so forth. What I'm concerned about is, is uh, demolitions that affect not only the, um, the, the density of the neighborhood, but the, the sort of streetscape and the feeling of it. So I think we're in agreement with you. It's a, it's a question of unintended consequences, and we need to wrap this up. Ms. Brewer. Exactly. Agreeing with what everybody else said, throwing in another reference to the master plan that everything we've done since we accepted many of the precepts of the master plan has been to de-densify things um, rather than densify them. It feels like we're continually stepping back away from that. Um, this has good potential. I think it can also be discussed in the context of the local historic districts that we have barely gotten off the ground. We're nowhere near close to having a second and third local historic district at this point. So I, I think that as these things continue to work through, this fits in with those and, some, and the work on, and continued work on the historic demolition permit that it's worth working on and it's, it's worthy of referral not to kill it, but to keep it in mind as we're working on all these other things together. Can you, can you suggest a time when you might ask that it be returned to town meeting? Because my experience is that articles that are referred to the planning board often don't come back except if the petitioner brings them back or the petitioners bring them back. So I, I think that I don't want to personally step on their prioritization schedule and I think that their prioritizing might well change considering the whole rental regulation thing that we're going to be coming up with. Who knows how much of that is going to be specific zoning bylaws that need to happen. So, um, so no, I, I'm not personally willing to add a time frame to that. Does anyone feel differently? Mr. Wall? No, I'm on the same page. And again, <clears throat> I wholeheartedly agree with the intention which is to prevent unwarranted teardowns, inappropriate structures, but I'm concerned about the density question. Uh, I'm concerned about ad hoc tampering with the, what's already a messy, ugly beast of a zoning bylaw that doesn't work very well with the master plan, and this should be developed, I think, in, in, in accordance with, in cooperation with the Historical Commission and Historic Preservation Practices and Research, and as you said, the local historic district committees aren't off the ground yet, so I think referral is good. Okay, Mr. Hayden, would you like to make a referral motion? Um, <clears throat> yes, I move that uh, we recommend to town meeting to refer Article 18 back to the planning board. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Um, Mr. Hayden. Just one brief addition. Um, we've seen articles like this before, and um, we uh, have been reminded by town meeting that there are lots of things that really should happen before we begin to tackle this, like the housing study and then some other things that uh, uh, town meeting has asked us to get done first, so. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, so it is now 7 o'clock. Did we miss anything on the motion sheet that we have to do tonight? I don't think so. Yes. We did. Uh, My motion to adjourn. Oh, we can't uh, have that motion yet. <laughs> but practically. So, just so you know, we are, uh, we're expecting town meeting to end tonight, but if we're wrong, then all kinds of crazy things happen. At this point, we're assuming town meeting ends and that we'll have a regular select board meeting back at town hall on just Monday evening. <laughs> if anything, if anything else happens, um, it, because of whatever happens tonight, I will inform you about our select board plans for Monday, if they have to change, if town meeting is still going on. That is all I have to add. Mr. Hayden, we're now ready for uh, I would uh, like, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Ms. Burr. Uh, That's the uh, comment who's section. Who's speaking to 19 oh. and 20? Uh, or 18 and 19, maybe? What did we do with uh, uh, Mr. 21. Hayden? Um, would you like to speak to 18, the referral motion that sure. you spoke eloquently to here? And does, would anybody like to adopt 19, Nuisance House? I'll adopt it. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so that will probably be tonight that you'll speak to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, Not much so to say, except why I think Sal is good. Okay, so, then so now, Mr. Hayden. Thank you. I'd like to move to adjourn. Without objection, this meeting adjourns at 7.01. Thank you very much. <laughs>